case study of and, and my reflections on many years of collaborative research investigating the sort of the opportunity and challenges of um, AI enabled speech interactions uh, with a particular focus on supporting diverse, resource constrained and um, very much underheard um, communities. And uh, critically, um, you can see in this case study the application of the human-centered uh, methods to machine learning that um, Matt, Simon, and Jen were uh, introducing yesterday. Um, so yeah, no, I'm, I'm very excited to be here because this is a bit of a homecoming for me. I studied at the University of Cape Town, um, and my thinking is very much um, shaped by the ict for d lab, um, where I did my honors, master's, and doctoral degrees. Um, so I came to Cape Town in 2008, and that was a particularly exciting point in time because there was a revolutionary technology that was altering the very basis of computing. And I'm talking, of course, of the mobile phone. Um, and yeah, what was exciting is that a, a digital technology was finding a foothold in places that often didn't have um, grid electricity. Um, so at the ict for d lab we researched and practiced methods of um, creating and um, yeah, making, uh, creating and sharing content easy for people who had jo only just obtained access to a mobile phone. So after graduating, I joined um, Swansea University and I now work at the Computational Foundry. And yeah, my desk is right next to the um, research crucible seen here. And I think I'm even in that, in the center, the blurry, blurry man in that picture. Um, and yeah, so foundry and crucible, those are of course words um, we commonly use in uh, yeah, metallurgy. Um, and this language emphasizes that when you bring together different things, um, in our case, I'll use it as a metaphor, sort of disciplines, communities, and technology, and then apply heat and ox oxygen, new and very useful things emerge. Um, so just like when I came to Cape Town in 2008, I think we're again sort of living through a particularly exciting moment in time where, um, yeah, the, the basis of technology is sort of changing and shifting again. I'm talking, of course, of um, AI and machine learning. Um, so in this talk, yeah, I'll be going over how we can forge new materials and forms of expression and digital participation by bringing together, yeah, dif uh, uh, disciplines, perspectives, communities, and technology. Oh, yeah, keep that away. Ah, okay, great, thanks. Um, so I want to uh, begin the story of this uh, research in, in Dharavi, so both, um, Simon and Matt mentioned Darvi yesterday, so I'll just give a really quick rehash. Um, Darvi is one of the most pop uh, densely populated areas of the world. It has between 700 and a million residents, um, and there are quite thriving formal and informal industries um, situated in Darvi. Um, so it was sort of a, a migrant um, area, so people speak Marathi, Tamil, Urdu, so those are sort of more common um, vernacular languages um, spoken in sort of, yeah, slightly different enclaves or corners of, of Dharavi. And then uh, Hindi is used as a vehicular language and is uh, sort of um, understood by most. Um, so uh, just to, we have a vernacular language is sort of the language that you might sort of speak with your gran. Um, so it's sort of used for participation in local life worlds, whereas a um, vehicular language is sort of the language typically used for sort of education and, and commerce. So these aren't sort of hard and fast rules, but sort of as a general um, heuristic, um, that's how you can differentiate the two. Um, so in Dharavi, uh, again to sort of rehash a bit from what Simon and Jen covered yesterday, we um, conducted um, design workshops to imagine and experiment with new technological possibilities for the future. 
um, and participants, um, yeah, and thinking about technology, identified some challenges or, or barriers to their participation. And in particular, that was around inputting text in their mother tongues. So in Dharavi, this might be uh, Marathi or Hindi or Urdu. Um, so they identified speech interaction as a possible way of breaking down these barriers. Um, yeah, so Simon yesterday covered how we rapidly prototype one of the ideas um, using a um, Wizard of Oz approach. So there was a smartphone and Bluetooth speaker embedded into that box connected to a, uh, by phone call to a person who was then um, yeah, on the fly answering questions that um, people posed uh, to the box. Um, so that sort of early stage research sort of prized an opening and a, a lot of uh, the research to date has been sort of following where that leads. Um, so given the, the success of that early exploratory work, we sort of knew that oh, we're onto something here. Um, so yeah, there were numerous intermittent prototypes, but these are the ones that were part of the larger scale deployment. So that was a machine powered prototype that ran basically the Hindi language of, uh, version of Google Assistant. Um, so yeah, they had just released it um, when we did this work in 2018, I think. Um, so yeah, Google Assistant, you press the button, you ask a question, what's the weather, and it'll give you the response. Um, and then we also had a human-powered version, sort of building on the success of the Wizard of Oz study that we conducted earlier, and our hunch that um, Google Assistant wouldn't be able to answer the types of questions that residents had there. Um, we also had a human-powered smart speaker. So it's called, yeah, a human-powered with delayed response. So the interaction there is you, you go up, you press the button, just with the Google Assistant version, you ask your question, but then instead of getting a response straight away, you get a, um, a four-digit code uh, that you're instructed to remember. So it might be one, two, three, four, and then instructions to return after about 10 minutes. Um, and so in the meantime, that question got forwarded to a crowd of human answerers. They would try to find an answer to that question within 10 minutes and then record their response. So then if the user comes back, keys in one, two, three, four, they would hear the response to the question. Um, so to give you sort of a high level overview of the, yeah, so we deployed that system for yeah, 40 days and um, yeah, they were very popular. So 12,000 questions were um, recorded. Um, and yeah, so yeah, I have sort of references um, everywhere in the slides and I will make sure to um, share them um, where you can look at the more detailed results. Um, but generally people were satisfied with the speed of um, the Google Assistant version. Um, Darvi is, it's just a sort of hustle and bustle. So um, nothing's better than instant. So people really like that, but they also appreciated the quality of the human powered answers. And almost exactly inversely, they were not satisfied with the quality of the Google Assistant answers and were not satisfied with the speed. Um, so yeah, no, 10 minutes is a long time in Darvi. Um, so in response to that, we developed a third um, prototype or third system a year later that uh, combined the two. So it had the um, physical design of this box here. You press the button, you ask a question, and then Google Assistant would try to answer the question. And then if you were not satisfied with the answer, um, you then had the option to forward it to the crowd of human answerers. And yeah, I think what's interesting here is sort of establishing consent at the point of interaction. So um, there's been a lot of um, investigative reporting and a lot of uh, concern expressed about um, smart speakers and, and voice assistants listening into conversations. Um, so what we did here is we made it an explicit option for users to say, this question, 
I want to forward to a human. It's okay if a human listens into this. And um, in 71% of the cases, um, they did this if they weren't satisfied with the answer that the Google Assistant provided. Um, so, yeah, here are some examples of the questions that people asked. Um, who is playing today? I think that's a great one because it sort of shows the sort of indexical nature of, um, yeah, of, of speech. Um, so, and that is exactly the type of question that sort of exposes gaps in what a AR system could, could do at the time. Um, and for the person, uh, the like uh, human workers answering questions, that was no problem because they could sort of draw on their shared experiences and, and context and answer the question. In this case, it was a, um, a cricket match that was happening. Um, yeah, there were also elections happening when the deployment took place in 2019. Um, so a lot of questions about that. When is the election? Um, yeah, who is the corporator? And what documents might I need for a identity card? So again, the crowd of humans were able to respond uh, when Google Assistant um, failed. Um, but what was also interesting was the, when we interviewed the crowd of human workers, they suggested automation as well. So they enjoyed sort of finding the sort of new answers, but there were a lot of repetitive questions about the election or about some, some other topic. And they wanted ways that, yeah, maybe they could sort of inform the, um, the model of the uh, instant responses. And so they, that their task is then to, yeah, pick up the slack when Google Assistant fell short, but were, could also then improve the system. So that was sort of an interesting um, model. And that was all sort of established with uh, clear um, user expectations and consent. But um, yeah, we're here in South Africa. And um, so what about here? There is no, um, yeah, uh, Google Assistant only supports, I think only supports English. Um, there is a ASR engine, um, Google Cloud Speech to Text, that supports Zulu, Afrikaans, and English. Um, yeah, I, and I think it's really great that Zulu is supported, but um, I think it sort of also raises a sort of political question of why Afrikaans and, and English, which are both sort of Germanic languages, and uh, not Isigosa. So in post-apartheid and post-colonial South Africa, these types of questions rarely have a neutral answer. So we wanted to address this gap in collaboration with um, some NLP researchers at the University of Edinburgh and in partnership with um, community members from Lange. So again, to remind you, yeah, Matt and Simon talked about it yesterday. Um, Lange is, yeah, not too far, uh, yeah, a quick drive along the N2 from here. It's one of the oldest townships in Cape Town and is now classified as a uh, previously disadvantaged area. It has about 50,000 residents, so much smaller than Dharavi, and yeah, a lot less uh, sort of economic uh, opportunity there. And um, yeah, residents are largely first language Isikosa speakers. And yeah, we drew on um, long-standing links we have with community members there. So we wanted to develop an ASR system, so we looked at what are the state-of-the-art approaches. So um, Facebook's um, really clever WAV to VEC approach um, stood out and was creating a lot of buzz and excitement. Um, but one of the problems for, um, in, in our case, is that it requires absolutely huge data sets, 53,000 hours, so that's about, um, six years of speech data, um, although most of that is unsupervised. Um, but I think this raises some sort of very critical questions of where does that data come from? And uh, yeah, Kate Crawford's book, The Atlas of AI, has been particularly illuminating here. So she um, thinks about AI as an industry that sort of um, extracts and um, abstracts data away from the yeah, material conditions of where it was created. Um, and she critiques um, the approaches that um, language data is somehow interchangeable, that it, it sort of any bit of text is just that text that a, um, 
a love poem is the same as a legal argument because they both use words. Um, and it also makes the assumption that that language data exists in the first place. Um, so there have been numerous studies that um, the yeah, people from Lange are really poorly represented in online spaces, and especially online spaces that are sort of indexed. Um, so a lot of um, chat, uh, whether sort of back in the day on Mixit and nowadays on, on WhatsApp, um, but there's very few uh, text data resources available, which is why, um, yeah, Sikosa is classified also as a low resource language in the jargon of NLP research. Um, and another problem is that, um, yeah, these state-of-the-art approaches are kind of being placed out of reach of um, sort of mere mortals. Um, so that only those really big entities, so your Facebooks, your Googles, your Microsofts, are able to actually afford the computational resources to develop a language model. Um, and then also, yeah, nowadays it's hard to look past the um, economic, uh, the environmental costs as well, both in terms of sort of the electricity and climate impacts and then the rare earth um, minerals required for, yeah, all that CPU and GPU power. Um, so, yeah, critical alternatives in Kate Crawford's view are clearly necessary. Um, and that process often starts and revolves around data. Um, so what do we talk about when we talk about data? Um, so I like the, yeah, sort of go back to the, the definitions and the history. So the word data is derived from the Latin verb dare, which means to give. And um, giving, so a, a datum is a thing given. Um, rather than a, a thing taken or scraped or extracted or um, mined. Um, and then, so when something is given, it's also interesting to look at um, some of the uh, anthropological and, uh, and social and cultural orientations to um, that, um, well, age-old human practice. Um, so Masa and Maus has written a a seminal essay, yeah, it's a quite quick, maybe a one hour read, that book, but is, is really, really profound and illuminating because he lays out in such sort of eloquent style the sort of the norms and expectations of gifting that, yeah, when you give something, then oftentimes you sort of expect something in return, or let's sort of turn that on the head. Whenever you receive something, you often feel obligated to, um, return something, some in-kind favor. And it's a, a form of a, sort of a total social system. So you know how with like NP hard problems, if you, if you face a new problem and you can prove that it is um, sort of equivalent to some known NP hard problem, um, then you've sort of proven that by association. So a lot of social practices can be explained through sort of the, the norms and um, association of, of gifting practices. So um, you're all here gifting me with your attention, and I'm reciprocating by having prepared and, and thought a lot about this talk. So that's sort of a, a one way of sort of thinking about that. Um, and I think for in the world of, of a, uh, machine learning and of data-driven systems, the sort of there's a similar reciprocal partnership between, um, well, designers and users, yeah, researchers and communities, they are reciprocally interdependent. Um, but this contrasts a lot with sort of the critique that um, Kate Crawford made, um, where data is something that can be taken and abstracted, and there often is very little, yeah, expectation. You don't even know who it came from. Um, a lot of language data actually happens to be um, Enron emails from that sort of corruption case from many, many years ago because they were disclosed openly. So zoop, they get vacuumed up into language models, but they're not really representative to how, uh, yeah, regular people speak. Um, so a core question for our team was, yeah, how do we retain some of that original meaning of the word data moving forward? And yeah, how can we 
sort of use that orientation to seed some uh, yeah, spoken language interactions, uh, specifically for minoritized languages. Um, so what we did, um, and this work was largely done during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so we had to convene some design workshops in quite unfamiliar um, remote forms. So that involved us sitting around a conference table in Swansea and then connecting to um, a market researcher in Langa and asking participants to use um, WhatsApp voice messages to sort of, yeah, we use that to engage them. What, what might they use speech interaction for? Um, so we paired uh, participants into, uh, yeah, so two participants plus the researchers, we created a WhatsApp group for each of them. So then total of six groups. Um, and we asked them to do some activities. So create some uh, voice reminders. So send a voice note to the group with something that they wanted to remember to do. Because we thought like, yeah, maybe it would be useful to create a um, reminder system. Or you could uh, sort of query for media content. So um, we asked them to share a video and then also um, speak the sort of search query that might surface that video. So we thought that might sort of uh, surface some ideas for, um, yeah, interactions. But um, what ended up happening is that most participants, once they completed the task, ended up chatting in the group. And that, yeah, again, at the start of the, um, of the workshop um, and at the beginning of every activity, we reminded people that everything you share in this group has a researcher in it and is with the purpose for um, analysis and um, for yeah, shaping, shaping our thinking and then yeah, dissemination as well. Um, so what the participants did was just end up um, chatting in their groups uh, after completing the task. And we benefited from the, uh, what was called the unplatformed approach. They have linked to the paper is here. Um, so what unplatformed means is that you, you try and meet the, the users or the, the um, benefactors of your systems on the platforms that they're already using. Um, so to many of the residents in Langa, WhatsApp represents a very familiar and authentic form of expression. So rather than sort of rolling out our own technology, um, which may have sort of yielded a, a more accurate data set because we could have captured more metadata or something like that, um, or could control what audio codec was used. With WhatsApp, we had the advantage that people already had it installed on their phones. Um, and again, yeah, the messages then yielded a very rich data set. Um, but the transcription task also became more error prone, which um, is, uh, yeah, what yeah, recent research has called sort of a data cascade, um, where sort of a problem with the data sort of manifests sort of a bit later on in the process. Because remember, at the time, we thought this was all um, sort of voice reminders and, and media queries. Um, so to give you an example of a, a voice message um, is, yeah, this one. I'm not going to read it out, but I've highlighted in, uh, in upright text uh, all the words that were in Isikmosa. In English, um, yeah, is bold. And then, yeah, there's one Afrikaans phrase, kokia, um, which is in italics. Um, but what's, what I find so interesting here, and which I think you should kind of really celebrate is sort of the creativity and innovation of, of language use. Um, so linguists refer to the process as code switching, switching between different languages. And yeah, residents in Langa called that just mixing. Um, and that also happens at a word, sort of at a sentence level, but then also sometimes at a word level. So e clock tower and e waterfront are good examples of that. So that sort of mixes a noun prefix from one language with then the noun from another language. So this presents then a lot of challenges for um, ASR models because, yeah, how do you model code switching at a word or a subword level? And would sort of some errors be okay there for participants giving that challenging context? Um, and then with regard to the voice messaging practices, what was interesting and underreported in the research literature is that 
participants reported that they used voice messages every single day. Um, yeah, Matt, Simon, and Jen were talking about sort of that designed in California mindset um, that sort of influences a lot of technology design. So there was also a study about voice messaging practices done in the US, and there it was reported that, yeah, you might record a, a happy birthday song for someone. Um, yeah, maybe if you had a, a newborn baby, you would record voice messages, but generally, the perception was that you were being sort of a little bit lazy by creating a voice message rather than typing it out. Um, or maybe, we, yeah, we can do sort of a quick poll here. Who has sent a voice message this week, sent or received? Put your hand up. So, quite a few. Doing sort of a similar poll at a, a different conference, I think only one or two hands went up because that practice seems to be more rooted um, here or uh, for people who speak um, more languages. Um, so in participants' views, um, voice messaging was seen as very convenient, so there was no spelling errors, and it made sure that everyone could understand you, no matter sort of what their um, textual or media literacy levels are. So it was seen as a very sort of positive and equalizing um, practice, in stark contrast to how voice messaging is seen in the US, where it's seen as sort of negative and, and lazy. Um, but it can be kind of tricky to keep up with sort of the amount of voice messages in larger groups. So to give you an example of that, imagine that your chat history looked like this. Um, so imagine the conference organizers had sent you a series of voice messages about the program, the technical content, the Wi-Fi password, when to have lunch, um, you would have a hard time. You could listen to them. Hopefully, you would remember everything, but you'd have a hard time sort of finding older content. What is the Wi-Fi password? Which voice message might contain the Wi-Fi password? So this is sort of a, a challenge that a lot of um, participants faced. Um, so they go through their WhatsApp chat logs, and they scroll. Scroll, 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 and, and try and find that old voice message that contained the directions to a friend's house. Um, yeah, and it was generally seen as not worth the effort if the message is older than three months. So in yesterday's talk, um, Simon and Jen mentioned that beautiful necklace that people had imagined that they could store their personal data on, sort of keeping it very close to their hearts. So a lot of these sort of voice messages um, and text message, media content, they are also a form of gift that the sender has sort of given to them. So they want to be able to also keep and um, re-listen to that. But it was seen, again, as not worth the effort because, yeah, it's just sort of buried in, in noise. Um, so what we did was built a prototype that um, surfaced ASR capabilities here. So again, plugging into I guess the Android share um, uh, interaction. So you long press on a, a voice recording, you click share at the top, and we built an app called Voice Notes. So you tap on that and it uploads it to a, um, one of our servers where it is transcribed using the um, ASR recognizer that the um, Edinburgh team had developed using some the scarce language resources that were available for Isikosa, which in that case was red speech. Um, so again, yeah, our paper has all the sort of nitty gritty details of the ASR system. But to get sort of back to the users, um, the ASR system wasn't, wasn't great, especially given that um, it was sort of faced with these types of challenges. Um, but it did perform, yeah, no, so yeah, the, the errors that it made are uh, yeah, somewhat unsurprising. So participants reported that it struggled with informal language, um, it made typos, um, and yeah, made errors in sort of switching between languages. So yeah, would incorrectly transcribe um, non-English words as, as English. Um, but they also um, reported some positive results. Um, 
So again, yeah, our paper unpacks these in a, in a lot of detail. Um, so they thought it was pretty cool experimenting with some of these more advanced AI capabilities in their mother tongue um, and suggested some other systems um, such as translating between languages. So this is sort of also a, uh, a benefit of using um, prototypes or sometimes we call them probes where you sort of put the technology in the hands of, of people and allow them to experiment with it like in, in their own ways, in their own con context, using their sort of their own um, speech. And then based off the sort of experience of using that, we're suggesting systems that in the really early workshops, um, people kind of struggled to, to come up with. Or they struggled to sort of relate of how ASR could have a more sort of concrete impact in, in their lives. Um, yeah, they also identified some report, uh, recordings where the system performed well or sort of well enough. Um, and what was really interesting was they thought about when it would be useful to, to um, be able to transcribe. Um, so we thought that, yeah, being able to sort of have a collection of recording, then up here you can search for them as well, and that that would be sort of the primary use case, sort of having that, uh, that archive, that sort of personal collection of voice recordings that were sort of important and cherished. Um, but what they also suggested was it was a way of sort of peeking at a voice message. Um, so in fact, uh, a few days ago, I was busy um, organizing with our collaborator in Lange to do some follow-up work, and she had responded with a 40-second voice message, and I was sort of in, uh, well, sitting back there. Um, so I'm assuming that also I see a lot of laptops, I see some mobile phones, and I'm guessing that some of you may have written a, a email, responded to an email, read a text message. So you're able to do that because text affords that possibility. You can glance at it discreetly without sort of interrupting the flow of this uh, presentation. But if you needed to listen to a voice message, you didn't have headphones, yeah, you would, it would be sort of a very awkward interaction. Um, and again, for our participants, they reported, yeah, using public transport, um, they didn't have mobile phones or the headphone jack was sort of busted because uh, when they dropped the phone or some dust had gotten in there. So they wanted a way to look at the uh, voice message content without necessarily needing to listen to it. And oftentimes within sort of a social com conversation, you all can already sort of expect the, the sort of the gist of the back and forth of, of a conversation. So being able to sort of draw on that sort of shared understanding gave us, gave our ASR system a, a little bit of the, of an advantage in more sort of qualitative evaluations of that than say a word error rate or character error rate um, metric would, would surface. So again, sort of you have a, a use case here that um, was, well, I found it tremendously useful when I was um, sitting in the audience a few days ago. Um, so we returned to Lange early last year um, to collect more data. Because, yeah, again, sort of our evaluations here reported that, yeah, it was making low, uh, too many errors. Um, and we needed more and better data. Um, but again, sort of thinking of back to Masa, Maus's essay about, yeah, what gathering data means, we also wanted the community to benefit from that. Um, so we worked closely with the market researcher and to find a topic that would be of sort of interest to the community that sort of every, where there's sort of a lot of talk about. Um, and that um, was uh, sort of stories of experiences of, of COVID-19. So we again deployed the familiar speech box hardware. Um, this time you press the button it prompts you to tell about your um, experience of COVID-19. When the, um, after finishing recording, a, a prompt is then played to um, ask whether the participant is happy to share that recording with the research team for analysis and for building technologies that you can speak to. Um, they then also had the option to re-record um, or 
if at any point they walked away and, and didn't consent to sharing, uh, then we would record, uh, delete the recording without uploading it. And then finally, after um, sharing the recording, we then uh, gave them the option of inputting their phone so that we could make a um, incentive payment to them, um, which we yeah, then did um, manually behind the scenes. Um, but we tried to do that sort of quite quickly to um, encourage uptake and participation. So we collected 318 stories um, and then yeah, made um, 318 airtime voucher payments. Um, and what was interesting is that we also sent out a text message asking them to fill out a, a survey about what languages they speak, what technologies do they use. And we incentivized that with the same payment amount. So you could get another 20 rand payment if you filled out this story, uh, this survey. And only 10% of participants did that. So showing again how speech and speech in public context was sort of a easy to use and accessible means for, yeah, gathering, um, yeah, community perspectives on, on the pandemic. Um, so again, communities like those in Langa are often sort of, I think quite inappropriately referred to as sort of hard to reach because the, the, our typical methods of engagement sort of fall short. They're hard to reach because we can't uh, scrape a data set off them and they don't bother filling out surveys. But if you sort of think about them, work with them and uh, engage with communities, you can find ways that um, of sort of creating that um, partnership. Um, so again, yeah, I think a, a speech box like that could be also an effective mechanisms for yeah, government organizations or NGOs. Um, but again, the speech data that came back is then from, from sort of a, an analysis perspective or if you wanted to do um, ASR development, only sort of half the equation. You need those transcripts as well. Um, so a further um, app that we developed that we sort of um, formed sort of part of a, a, a toolkit for doing community engaged ASR development is a, uh, yeah, a transcription app. Um, and this tries to boil down the transcription app in a uh, mobile friendly and accessible way. So it takes sort of, uh, I think on the speech box we recorded up to two minutes of audio. Um, and then the software then splits that up into smaller chunks. Um, and all of those chunks overlap by about, I think, three quarters of a second. So if a word is cut off at the end of one chunk, it'll be picked up at the beginning or the overlapping beginning of the, of the second one. So you sort of go through listening to a, about five seconds of audio and then transcribing what you hear. And then you move on to the next segment. And then until you get to the end, um, but what, and we asked three, uh, had recruited um, five transcribers from the community and asked them to, uh, yeah, they transcribed in triplicate. So every, um, every story got um, transcribed by, or either two or mostly three transcribers. So that allowed us to sort of assess the um, consistency or, or variability of the, of the transcripts. Um, and what that, revealed in, in a very sort of concrete way is how Isigosa has quite sort of, is a weakly standardized language, which is typical of more vernacular languages. Um, so the written norms and forms of the language haven't really sort of kept abreast with the sort of the vibrancy and innovation of language use in context, um, particularly around how um, yeah, words are segmented. If you speak very fast, you tend to sort of, um, like one word sort of bleeds into the next one. So it then became difficult for transcribers to um, sort of agree on a, a gold standard transcript. And that's sort of, a, a, again, a core assumption of, um, of ASR development methodologies is that there is such a thing as a gold standard transcript. Um, our community generated transcription efforts sort of showed that that wasn't the case. We had sort of three transcriptions of the same audio file. They were legible to um, the transcribers themselves and to other people, but they weren't in a form that was sort of amenable to um, 
well, immediate uh, integration into ASR development pipelines. So again, this sort of surface, sort of the, the, the challenges that working with people and working with communities creates for, yeah, some sort of really deeply held uh, norms and, and assumptions that we, that we make. Um, so that became, so the data, not just for ASR development, it's sort of a, a valuable sort of conceptual tool that you can use to look at, like, is, is the pipeline that I'm, that I've sort of created for, um, yeah, developing user-facing ML systems, can it, can it actually work on the data that is being generated in the community? So then, yeah, so using the data, we were ultimately able to improve the sort of code-switched ASR system from a character error rate from around 50% to 27%. Uh, so um, that was a good and positive result. Um, and that is typically sort of the end of a um, NLP contribution. So we collected data, we developed the system, and we can show an improvement. Full stop, thank you to everyone, end of, end of contribution. Um, but what is sort of really important uh, in sort of community-engaged research is to, again, going back to mouse and mouse and the original meaning of the word data is to reciprocate, to feed back the results of the research, which in our case was an improved ASR system, but also the corpus of collected stories. Um, so we created a slightly um, more polished um, speech box, um, this time mirroring the look of a actual smart speaker, where people could press the button, uh, yeah, again, walk up to public, uh, five publicly deployed devices in Lange, press the button, then they're prompted to, um, to yeah, tell us sort of what aspect of, of COVID-19 they would be interested to hear more about. So that could be sort of jobs, money, medicine, of loss. Um, and then the transcriber would transcribe their query. And then, um, yeah, using sort of uh, common information retrieval approaches, um, I think we used Elasticsearch, um, we would query the corpus of 318 stories, which we had also transcribed using the ASR system. And if there was a match, we would then play back that story on the device. Um, so there were 750 total interactions. Many of those did not generate a transcript. We don't know if that was because, um, well, they didn't say anything or because there was, the recognizer didn't recognize anything. Again, these are public deployments, so oftentimes there are multiple people speaking or there's music in the background. Um, but again, since we hadn't sort of established sort of consent at that point to collect data, we um, yeah, decided to not include it for analysis, but only for transcription. And then when a transcript was returned, um, yeah, we would play the story and then, yeah, in some cases they rated it as, um, as relevant, but oftentimes I think they were just sort of done with the interaction. They listened to the story and, and walked away. So I think sort of further down in this Sankey plot, um, yeah, the, the numbers get too low for really to infer any results. Um, so that was then the end of that phase of, of the project. So again, that, uh, that emphasis on reciprocity and, and going back, returning to the communities that you collected data from um, to feed back the results. And yeah, 10 days ago, um, I was in India working with a Banjara community, which is sort of the next phase of this, um, of the project that I'm working on. Um, and Banjaras are um, trader or, or nomads and have settled in different places in India. Um, and what's interesting is they speak a distinct language called Gormati, which doesn't actually have a written form. Um, so there's some sort of attempts to transliterate it using a, a different alphabet, but that is only done by a, a, a small minority of people. Um, and yeah, the community I went to is about a 10 hour drive from 
Mumbai. And what we did in this community was now we had to work under sort of much tighter constraints from the um, NLP research side because it is an unwritten language where there are no textual resources available. Um, we had to yeah, think about a data collection exercise that was sort of more domain constrained. Um, so we did some yeah, more ethnographic research, building links to the community over um, multiple visits spread out over a couple of months. Um, and then we launched into a, a more focused data collection um, visit where we took photos or asked community members to take photos of um, the different crops that they were growing. So we identified sort of two domains. One was sort of around farming and one was around sort of domestic life. Um, and then asked them to create these photo slideshows, which they could then annotate with a voice recording. So yeah, we had to sort of do quite a lot of sort of public engagement around, um, yeah, what, what sort of uh, data AI systems need in order to sort of develop a acoustic model of the language and then do some yeah, quite simple information retrieval such as spotting keywords. Um, the one uh, scenario that they came up with is that it could be good to um, be able to query market prices of the different crops that they grow. Um, and they had a Gomati speaking person on one of the farm boards in the uh, next largest city. So the idea was that he could create sort of a long recording with the prices. And if you could sort of spot keywords such as millet or wheat or uh, cotton, you could then sort of go to that bit of the recording and say, um, say the price. Um, so again, for a so-called zero resource language, this is sort of a, about what you can do um, in terms of developing uh, speech and language technologies because there is sort of uh, the challenges are such that, and there are so few uh, language resources available. Um, yeah, so that was what we're doing with the sort of younger community members creating these slideshows. And then for, um, for elderly people, we also developed a IVR system, an interactive voice response system. So it's basically a phone number that they could call and then leave a voice message about, yeah, sort of what they did in the farms um, on that day um, or sort of around the, the homestead. Um, so again, sort of checking that, like if you, if you do sort of community-centered data collection exercise, making sure that you're getting sort of broad and diverse um, voices. Um, and then we also asked um, community members here to include, um, yeah, to make sure to include women in the exercise, whereas sort of initially, I think only a, a few men had stepped forward. Um, so yeah, our ambition is again to collect about 30 hours of um, domain constrained um, speech to develop sort of a, a simple demonstrator application of what speech and language technology can do for a zero resource language like Gormati. And then again, the hope is like with the voice messaging um, scenario I d uh, talked about earlier, is that then that unlocks sort of new suggestions for use cases, such as being able to discreetly look at a voice message when you're on a taxi. Um, so yeah. And then to wrap things up, um, yeah, what I hope to have shown here is that doing sort of community engagement throughout uh, machine learning development cycles minimizes the chance for um, data cascades. So our training data set for the initial um, Lange ASR system had used red speech. Then our engagement in the community surfaced that, oh, actually, voice messaging is a, a perfect use case. There's a lot of speech data um, being generated by people. Um, and a, a, a huge opportunity for um, community impact. Um, but red speech and conversational speech are two completely different things. So they lack, the, it's different speeds, different uh, intonation, 
Um, so we were able to sort of avoid that data cascade of sort of completing the ASR development pipeline just on red speech and not really accounting for how people act in, in practice. Um, yeah, I've also talked about sort of some of the assumptions and, and orthodoxies of these uh, development pipelines that you have sort of a, an objective ground truth. You like a voice uh, message has a gold standard um, transcript. Our, yeah, again, sort of community engaged research showed that that's not always the case. Um, so coming back to what I learned in 2008 when I first joined the uh, University of Cape Town as a student, they're sort of learning about the methods of human computer interaction and of interaction design. We learned sort of approaches to co-create an interface, a scenario and a use case. So these are sort of tried and tested methods that have shown to work in sort of diverse contexts to ensure that the technologies that you develop meet the needs of people. Um, but I think particularly for this audience, what we have shown is those same methods can also work to co-create a representative data set. That might not be of the scale of, of WAV to VEC, of six years of audio data, but of really, really invaluable testing data that can sort of guide how you, how you tune, how you evaluate models and avoid those sort of um, quite costly data cascades. Um, and then again, yeah, I want to thank um, all of the yeah, community members, the participants, facilitators, um, transcribers, and translators without whom we could not have done this research. Um, and then actually I did um, bring a IVR system with me, which I will plug into a battery bank very soon. Um, it's in my backpack, I'll do that straight away. So if you wanted to test out that system and give us some, uh, some feedback on, um, on our series of talks, yeah, you can call this uh, number here. Just give me a couple of minutes. Um, and then these two websites, Reshaping the Future and Unmute.tech, have a lot of the toolkits and papers that I've uh, referenced in this talk. That being said, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thanks, Thomas. Uh, any questions? Uh, okay, if there are no questions, I'm sure we can, uh, we can also catch Thomas uh, d d during uh, tea time. And thank you very much. I think this was a third of, your, of the Swansea uh, uh, contribution. And so thank you very much for your contribution and also for the rest of the team. We appreciate that. Okay, okay. thank you so much. Mm -hmm.